You're listening to Great Life, Great Career with Scott Miller, brought to you by Franklin Covey. Welcome back, everyone. Fascinating conversation listening to the renowned psychiatrist and author, Dr. Mark Goulston, author of numerous books, including Just Listen, Get Out of Your Own Way, and the book we're talking about today, Talking to Crazy, something I've got a few closest emotions with, how to deal with the irrational and impossible people in your life. I sure hope my wife's not listening to this program today. Um, I may block this out from her podcast feed. Mark, welcome back to Great Life, Great Career. Thank you, Scott. In fact, I want to build on what you just said. So here's something that you can use with your with your wife. Oh, please. Today. Okay. Okay. So uh, uh, next time you get into a tiff with her, and it sounds like when you get into a tiff, you'd like her to calm down. You'd like her to listen to reason. You may give her advice. You may give her solutions, none of which she wants. Yeah, the Gucci purse never works. There you go. There you go. So here's what you say. Uh, uh, again, let her get some stuff off her chest and then look her in the eye in a very calm way. Okay, you're not, this is not an intimidating thing. It's just, it shows that you're fully present. You say, uh, I want to try something that I think might help us uh, get through this fast. And, to, and, and, and you can say, just play along with me. And if it doesn't, you know, if it doesn't go right, then we'll just get back to where we are. Uh, I want you to look at me and say, Scott, um, when, when I just want you to listen to me uh, and you try to either run away from it, give me a solution, give me advice, it makes me feel worse. In fact, it makes me nuts. So could you please not try and jump in to shut me down when I'm just trying to get stuff off my chest? Because I think if I get stuff off my chest, I'll feel much better than the way you usually handle it. Could you do that for me, Scott? And so what you're doing is you're giving, you're you're empathizing with her. You're putting yourself in her shoes. And when she starts to say it, you're not going to get defensive because you're sort of in charge of the conversation without being controlling. And what you're really doing is you're helping diffuse it because you're actually giving her uh, the words for what she's feeling. And then when she says that, uh, instead of jumping down the throat, you might say, wow, uh, how often do I do that? Uh, and, and it'll help you turn everything around. Are can you, you can you can you see that in your mind's eye? I can. I I could use more of that. Are you taking new patients? <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't a joke. We'll talk off air. But 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 can I give you? I, I get a, if you like that anecdote, and if your listeners, for the women who are listening, uh, a woman approached me and she said, "I've got this issue with my husband." He tells me that I blither and I plead no contest. I do blither. But here's the deal. When we're with other people, people like me, even if I blither, and he's a bit of a stiff. He's kind of an engineer. And when we get into any kind of an argument and I raise my voice, he looks at me like a deer in the headlights of a car and he tries to talk me down. It actually makes me feel more crazy. So I gave her this advice. I said, next time you're in an argument with your husband, uh, now, this is going to require you stopping yourself kind of in, in mid, uh, you know, uh, mid-venting. Right. And, and you'll say to them, you can say, uh, hey, I, I, hey, I got a way through this. Can you play along with me? Now, he'll think, oh, argument's over. We'll go out. We'll have dinner. Maybe we'll get lucky. Who knows? Uh, but uh, And they'll say, what? You could say, yeah, play along with me. And then she said to her husband, we'll call him Joe, and we'll call her Joan. She, she said, Joe, look at me and say this to me. Uh, Joan, when we get into disagreement and you start to get all emotional and everything I say is wrong, and if I say nothing, it's wrong, I really feel like just running full speed and smashing my head into the wall. So can you, can you, can you try something else, Joan? And so he's a little <laughs> bit constipated because he's an engineer. He goes, what? And I said, just try it. Three days later, she calls me. She said, I got good news and bad news. I said, what's the good news? She said, I did that with Joe. And, uh, and he was a little full, like, well, what do you mean? She said, just try it on. And he sort of tried it on. And then she said, and I kept pushing him. I said, you can do better than that. And I kept goading him to get it off his chest. So the good news 
is in about five minutes, he's venting at me things about his mother, his, his former girlfriends, his boss. He's getting it all off. So that's the good news. I said, what's the bad news? She said, after he did that, he just came over to me like a puppy dog. And he said, you're my best friend. I adore you. And he's hugging me all the time. Oh, I'm so in love with you. And, and Mark, he's creeping me out. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I said, don't worry, don't worry. It'll, it'll deteriorate. Just try and maybe not go all the way back to where it was. So, Mark, it's clear that I am my wife's crazy. This is not up for debate, right? I mean, it's very clear. And I like to fight. I actually love to fight. In fact, I like to fight after it's even done. And my wife will say she won't fight back ever. And she'll say to me, well, I can never win. You just, like, you'll filibuster until you've lost your voice. You'll just keep going, Scott. What advice would you give Stephanie Miller on how to deal with the crazy that is her husband, Scott Miller, who will just fight even after it's, she's given up? I'll just keep going and fatigue the hell out of her. And then I want to go to dinner. Or better yet, so make Steph love. She's like, I don't even want to touch you. So, Stephanie, if you're listening, or you can edit this portion in post-production, just give it to her, Scott. <laughs> what, uh, again, let, uh, let Scott sort of finish, pause, and say, Scott, um, you're like a dog with a bone, and you can't let something go. And where did you learn that from? Did your mom or dad do that? And did you like watching either your mom or dad never give up on something, always always beating a dead horse? I mean, where did you learn that from? And hopefully it'll cause you to, uh, uh, it may cause you to think, you know, my mom was like that or my dad was like that. Well, did you enjoy watching them do that? Did you enjoy watching your dad or your mom's reaction when the other one was like this dog with a bone and couldn't let something go? And you might say, no, no, I kind of felt badly for my mom or my dad or, or wherever you learned it from. So, oh, okay, well, so realizing how badly you felt for whoever that was, would you want to make me feel bad like that? Can you follow any of that? Oh, yeah. You're listening to Great Life, Great Career. Our guest is the insanely wise Dr. Mark Goulston, renowned psychiatrist, author of numerous books, including this book, Talking to Scott, also known as Talking to Crazy, how to deal with the irrational and impossible people in your life. Mark, great advice. Thank you. My wife will be grateful to you. I listen to you carefully. Mark, Mark in this book, Talking to Crazy, you, you popularize these things you call the four H's and the four R's. Let's spend about five minutes on each. The four H's to kind of begin the healing. You call them hurt, hate, hesitant to trust, and hold a grudge. Spend about a minute on each of those, if you will. Okay, so when you have hurt someone or you deceived or betrayed them, you trigger in them hurt, you wounded them, they hate you because you've taken away the ability to trust you. Uh, they're uh, hesitant to trust you again because they feel you'll just keep doing it. You know, a, a tiger doesn't change its, a zebra doesn't change its stripes. And they're going to hold on to a grudge to protect themselves because they don't think you're going to change. And so what the four H's need, uh, and I actually wrote, I've written a couple of blogs on how Wells Fargo needs this because they just keep doing it. And so what the four H's need are the four R's. So what hurt needs, the first R is remorse. And remorse is different than regret. In fact, when you show regret without remorse, you actually insult people. And what regret, without remorse looks like it. Okay, I know I did it. Okay, I'm going to stop doing it. You know, can you get off my back? Can we just move on? That's not a heck of a great apology. Remorse means you actually realize that you did that and you own it. You take full responsibility for it. Uh, I have a friend who coaches white collar criminals because he, he, he got, uh, he was a white collar criminal and just changed his life. And he said one of the main problems for white-collar criminals is they try to impress the judge with all the great things they've done, and the judge has heard that a million times. And what he coaches them is you've got, you got to take the hit. You've got to own up to it. You've got to own that you did wrong and, and what you're doing to rehabilitate yourself. You've got to be humble. So remorse means you actually show them that it causes you pain that you did that to them. 
So the second H is they hate you requires the second R, and the second R is restitution. There needs to be a payback, and the payback's got to hurt you. Now, the payback may be you got to write them a check, or the payback means that they get to vent at you and tell you all the things you did and how you destroyed trust in them and how you, they can never trust you again and yada, 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 and you can't defend yourself. So the restitution is a payback for the hate that they're feeling. The third R is rehabilitation to go along with their hesitation uh, to trust you. And rehabilitation means you have to change the way you deal with things so that you never do what you did before. But what they need to see is that you like the new you. You can't just be doing it to get them off your back. But you need to reach a point where you say, wow, uh, if I knew it was so simple to just deal with things this way, I never would have been such a jerk. Jeez, my whole life would have been different. So when they feel you've rehabilitated yourself, uh, they're willing to um, uh, to they're, will, they're willing to be less hesitant to trust you. Now the fourth R is you request forgiveness, and when you request forgiveness. You do that after a minimum of six months of practicing and internalizing the first three R's, remorse, restitution, and rehabilitation. Uh, and, and requesting forgiveness goes along with, uh, is the response to their holding a grudge, they're holding their guard up. And here's the good news. If you really, you can't change the past, but if you really have internalized remorse, restitution, and rehabilitation, and you ask for forgiveness, and they don't forgive you, it switches to their being unforgiving. You're no longer unforgivable. And then what I bring up to them is kind of like what I flipped to you before we got into this. Uh, what I would say to that person uh, who used to say to them, well, I don't think I can forgive them. And I say, uh, did you have a parent who was unforgiving? you know, either towards your other parent or unforgiving towards you? Yeah. Uh, what does it feel like, you know, when uh, when that unforgiving trait of your mom or dad was aimed at you or aimed at uh, your, mom, the other, your other uh, parent? It was horrendous. Wow, you learned it well. <laughs> so, so that's a way to sometimes get through the four H's and the four R's. You're listening to Great Life, Great Career. Our guest today is Dr. Mark Goulston, author of this book, Talking to Crazy. Mark, you've mentioned several times our parents and kind of, did your parents do it that way? Did you watch your parents? As a psychiatrist, what insight would you provide to all of us to uncover, own, leave behind, just to recognize the role, the impact that our parents had on us? What are some exercises or insights you could teach us in a minute or two, I know it's ambitious, around kind of recognizing the disproportionate impact our parents played in our lives, and are there some ways we can kind of like let it go or own it, for good or bad? It's interesting. Well, it's interesting you bring this up because I'm hoping to do a TED Talk somewhere on never feeling good enough. A lot of people feel, uh, I'm, never, I'm never good enough, and, and I've suffered with that, and I thought, geez, uh, it's, I always thought, well, I didn't make enough money or I didn't perform well enough or I didn't do such and such. But even when I made money or I performed well, I still didn't feel good enough. And here was the breakthrough for me, Scott. It's not that I wasn't good enough in my performance. It's that I didn't, I didn't have enough goodness in me as a person because even though the world doesn't see me this way because I have it, I guess, deeply covered up, there's something called your shadow. That's the part of your personality you don't want to deal with. My shadow is I, you know, I have chips on my shoulder. I, I can be jealous. I can, you know, wish hurtful things to people, you know, that have hurt me. And I realized it was interesting. And my father died uh, over 20 years ago, and I was holding a grudge against him. But I looked at me through his eyes, and I realized that a lot of the things I thought he was doing that I felt hurtful and critical, it's because he was anxious. He was worried. He, he wanted to protect me from, uh, uh, you know, and he, and he was an accountant type, and I didn't realize that I'm a creative, maybe even entrepreneurial type. So any time that I was coming up with something creative, he'd always put it down, 
but through his eyes, he just wanted to protect me from doing something and having everything blow up. And so it's fascinating because I've been apologizing. He's been dead over 20 years. I've been apologizing to him in my mind. I've been saying, you know, Dad, God, looking at me through your eyes, um, you were just trying to protect me. And I'm sorry that I took it wrong. And I'm sorry that I, you know, I've held this resentment against you. And it's helping, Scott. I mean, this never feeling good enough is starting to heal a little bit. And I think it's because uh, I, I'm writing the wrong and the, and, and the way I've seen things from some of the people who actually really uh, cared about me, and I didn't see it that way. Mark, your vulnerability and wisdom is profound. I have thoroughly enjoyed listening to you today. I'd like to spend the last two minutes together having you talk about your passion for listening and how, how all of our listeners— can do a better job at that and the impact it will have in their relationships. Give us your best two minutes on listening. Okay, so one of my personal passions is suicide prevention. So I was a suicide prevention specialist for 25 years and none of my patients killed themselves and I've been trying to figure out what the heck I did. And and what I realized, which is in my book, uh, Just Listen and Talking to Crazy is something I call interventional empathy. So if you're listening and you have a teenager or a spouse or someone you're worried about who's in a dark place and and you say, you know, what's on your mind? And they say, leave me alone. Uh, What you do is, uh, if it's a teenager, uh, instead of saying, okay, you know, uh, 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 I'm here to listen to you, which just aggravates them, let them vent that teenage-ism, you know, get off my back pause for two seconds and say, yeah, I know you want me to leave you alone, but seven words. And they're going to say, what? And then you say this and you're inviting them to get it off their chest. Yeah, seven words, hurt, afraid, angry, ashamed, alone, lonely, tired. Pick one. And I have a documentary called Stay Alive, which is available on YouTube at uh, youtube.com forward slash stay alive video. And in that we, I interview a fellow who jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge and survived. And when I've used that with suicidal, depressed people, what happens when you say it that way, they smile and they say all of them. And you say, pick one. And they start to talk to you. They start to cry with relief. They start to feel better. Mark, it's been um, an honor to have you on our program today. I'd love to have you back sometime and talk about your book, Get Out of Your Own Way. Mark, Dr. Mark Goldston, thank you for joining Great Life, Great Career Today. Thank you, Scott.